Welcome to Art Time with Mr. Barry. Today we're going to be learning about shading. When we add shading to our artwork through the use of value, which is where something sits on the scale of light to dark, we are then able to enhance a number of attributes of said piece. First and foremost is form. Shading allows us to create a sense of physicality and three-dimensionality within the objects that we are depicting in our image. Second is light. Through the use of shading, we are able to suggest light hitting our objects, and then those objects casting shadows onto each other and also onto the surface that they are sitting on. When we combine these two attributes, we are also then able to use shading to enhance our sense of space, atmosphere, and mood. For example, if we took a still life of a vase of flowers and we shaded it with really heavy shadows, um, really dark background, and just a little bit of light hitting the edge of the flowers in the vase, it's going to create a much darker type of mood and feeling within it. However, if we take that same image but we shade it with little trickles and hints of shadow on one side and mostly using midtones or bright values to suggest a lot of light hitting said flower in a vase, it's going to create a very different mood. So within our artwork, shading really lets us to control the narrative that we want to create, even disregarding the initial narrative that is created by our imagery. Before we start working on our drawing, we want to make sure that we first have our setup all set and ready to go. Whether it be a still life such as I have here, um, or a person that we're drawing from, we want to make sure that they're properly composed and most importantly, properly lit. As you can see here, I definitely do have light source hitting this apple, red onion, and sweet potato, but they're not particularly strong. There are some shadows down at the bottom here, below the apple and below the sweet potato, um, and there's some light hitting the top of them, but it's generally pretty even um, or really not very dynamic. The other thing you can see is that I have multiple light sources, which is given away by the fact that there's multiple different edges of shadows along the bottom. So what I really want to do is I want to give myself a stronger, more dynamic sense of light and shadow in my image to not only create more interest for the viewer when they're looking at it, but to also make it easier for me to draw. When lighting your still life or person, you have a lot of different options for where you can have that light source coming from. I generally recommend the upper front corners of your setup, such as the right upper corner over here, or the left upper corner over here. As you can see, these setups create a nice, clean, strong light and shadow combination on your still life. You can see the lights hitting the green apple and the back edge of the sweet potato really nicely, um, and also creating some really nice, strong shadows on the other objects and on the tabletop and back wall. As I said, I can also move this over to the left side and get essentially the same effect uh, just from a different angle. Like I said, this is not the only options. You can do lighting that comes center and above. Um, this does look really nice and creates a kind of haloing effect around the still life objects, but you will see we are sacrificing some of the shadow, especially on the tabletop, in order to have this effect. Another angle that can work really well is from a complete side. Um, it tends to create a very dynamic, um, almost renaissance type of light source that really has really strong highlights and really strong shadows. For the exercise that we're going to go over today, I will be using the upper right corner light source as I think it'll give us a good understanding of how to see the light and shadow on our objects and it'll also give us enough variation to kind of play around with. Before we can start adding shading to our drawings, we first need to go over some of the different mark making techniques that we can use for creating variations of value within our work of art. Today we're going to be discussing blending, cross hatching, and a combination of the two. There are certainly more than just these three techniques, 
However, these are the most common and most likely the easiest to use. First off, blending. Blending is when you take the side of the lead of your pencil and rub it back and forth on your paper in order to create a value on the surface. The harder you press down or the more pressure you apply to your pencil, the darker the mark is going to make. Something that is really nice about the blending technique is it tends to create a nice smoother transition from one value to another. The other thing to keep in consideration is you can always use something like your finger, a piece of paper towel, or some tissue paper to smudge the lead that you have on your piece of paper and to create smoother transitions than your pencil naturally made or even to potentially create some other subtle variations of value. Second up is cross-hatching. Cross-hatching is the use of a singular mark, such as a hatch, and then allowing them to build themselves up over each other in order to create a sense of a value. So essentially what you are doing is you are literally crossing your hash marks. Cross-hatch can also be used to show a variation in different values by letting marks sit further apart when you want a lighter value and closer to each other when you want a darker value. For example, as these are closer, they read darker, but as I let them get further apart, they start to feel lighter. Combination is simply a combination of both blending and cross-hatching. Uh, you can work them back and forth in any particular way that feels comfortable. Um, but the thing that's really nice about combination is that it allows for some of the more subtle, fine detail that comes with blending and also some of the darker darks that are possible with cross-hatching. Now that we have composed and lit our still life to give us an engaging image, and that we've gone over the different techniques that we can use to add shading to our drawing, it's time to actually get started. The first thing we need to do is to construct the drawing that we are going to be shading on top of. Uh, I use the same techniques that we covered in the drawing video of using simplified shapes to create my outline drawing. Now that I have my drawing all set up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a moment, look at my still life, and try to see where I see the big general shapes of light and dark on my objects and the surface. So looking at my still life, I can see that I have shadows on all three objects, and that all three objects are casting shadows onto the surface they are sitting on, with the apple also casting a shadow onto the sweet potato, and the sweet potato and onion casting a shadow onto the wall. Looking closely at all of my objects, I have outlined the shadows that I have on my green apple, my red onion, the sweet potato, and the shadows that they are casting onto both the surface and the back wall. I now know that these areas that have been shaded in dark gray are where I will need to add shadows to my drawing. Now that I've found the big shapes of my general lights and darks, I can start actually adding them into my drawing. Now I have two different ways I can do this. If I feel really comfortable with it, I can just freehand sketch them on, or I can actually create little outlines. For example, there's the shadow that goes around the base of the onion. Uh, it starts over here, up on the midpoint of it, comes down, wraps up, and then goes around the back. There's also a shadow that comes up the stem and hits over there. And then I simply take the side of my pencil and I do a general shading in of that whole section. At the same time, if I'm feeling really confident out of it, I can actually just start drawing without even doing the outline. So for example, on the sweet potato, I have a little bit of shadow that comes over here, it comes over, and then it starts going up. And I'm kind of like drawing with the shading right now. You know, I'm kind of staying to the inside of it, letting myself push to the outside of the shadow area as I feel more and more confident about what I'm doing. So, as you can see, I have finished blocking in the lights and darks of my shadows. Now keep in mind these are really simplified ideas of where the shadows are. I'm really just covering general ground and doing a general blocking in. 
The other thing to notice is that I'm also uh, adding in the shadows in a fairly light manner. The reason for this is that similar to our drawing exercise, we want to make sure that we can erase and adjust things really easily as we move along, especially at these early stages. You know, I may put an area of shadow in somewhere that's not completely correct, and right now going light will let me erase it a lot easier. So, once we have our general kind of blocking of light and shadows down, the next thing we want to do is we're actually going to start working back from darkest shadows to lightest shadows. So I'm going to look at my image, I'm going to find the moments where it's absolutely the darkest and start putting those in. I'm not going to put them in quite as dark as they are in real life. I will kind of come back at the very end of the drawing and like touch things up, but I will put them in fairly dark right now. As you can see here, the highlighted areas are the darkest shadows in my still life and the ones I will now be adding to my drawing. So now that I put those darkest darks in, or at least kind of blocked in where they will be later on, you can see that my drawing's already starting to take more form because I already have this variation of a light, a mid-tone, and a dark, which is helping really kind of give them a sense of like form and structure. What I'm be doing next is kind of looking at my next step down darks. So places where it's still dark, um, it's not as dark as the moments like the inside shadow of the onion, but places where they're still much darker than that kind of general shadow that I put down. Places where I'm going to be looking for this is, for example, on this uh, shadow that's on the sweet potato that's been cast by the green apple. It gets pretty dark, um, but it's not nearly as dark on the back edge of the apple that's created by the light itself. I'm um, also on the back edge of the red onion and in this back area of the wall. So here I have outlined those next step shadows and even shaded them in to help make them easier to see. So now that I've done that, I've added those like kind of little transitional moments of where it's slightly darker, such as it was over here, um, but you know, darker than the initial kind of value I put down for some of my shadows, but not as dark as my darkest darks. One of the things you may have noticed is that some of my moments of darker dark have actually gotten a little bit darker since I last showed you the drawing. And this is one of the reasons why when we lazy down, we don't go all the way. Because when I was shading this in, I was able to go over the whole surface. And as I was shading this whole section of shadow darker and going over this, it was naturally just making this darker as it goes along also because it already had that material laid down on it. Now that I have the kind of general transitions of my main shadows down, what I'm going to do is start looking for moments where I'm kind of overlooking some of the more subtle variations and shifts that happen in the lights of my apple, onion, and sweet potato. So while I have been using one of my softer pencils recently, uh, I'm gonna go to one of my light ones and really look for some of these more subtle transitions that like exist within there. Um, once again, you can do what you did before, which is outline them or freehand draw them. Um, but I will say that once we get to this point, um, we're using a lot more kind of like in the moment decisions. So we're not gonna be doing quite as much of like pausing, looking for a specific shape of a shadow, and then blocking in as much as we're gonna be doing, looking for like little moments where we notice kind of like little variations in the way that the shadow works. Like for example, this dark shadow underneath the stem of my uh, red onion actually fades out a little bit on the edge. So I'm gonna give it a little bit of a transition here, let it fade and kind of disappear into the ether. This actually should also probably come up a little bit. You know, I, as you can see, I drew it a little low originally, and I want to create a little bit more of a transition between some of those shades. Um, there's also a kind of a harder shadow right here that comes up and goes over and kind of wraps around the shape of the onion. So what you can see is I'm really just kind of now walking around and I'm just kind of free drawing. I'm looking for little moments, little transitions. Um, there's a little bit of edge of shadow on the very edge of this apple. So I'm just gonna very lightly add that in. I don't want it to be super strong because it'll create like a really hard edge on my apple, which I'll flatten it out and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I do want something to show that it's a rounded form and kind of going around. The shadow of my apple, especially in the bottom, should also get a little bit stronger. I'm gonna go back to one of my softer pencils, 
because I'm not quite getting the value I want. So remember, like, not only can you create value through the way that you uh, press down on your pencil, but also through the type of pencil that you use. Uh, I need some more shadow on the back edge of this sweet potato. It's getting a little flat there. So I'm going to start off once again, always start really light. You know, we can always make it darker, but it's definitely easier to have to make something darker than to have to make something lighter. Pull it down. Uh, it gets a little bit darker right in this kind of crook. And then this can even come down a little bit too. And then this over here comes down a little bit further too, but there is a nice highlight right there. This feels a little flat. There's actually, if I can see, there's a little bit of a shadow that kind of comes around the edge where it gets a little bit darker from the cast shadow of the sweet potato. And then the shadow actually gets a little bit lighter as it moves in towards the table from the reflected light, which is light that is bouncing around the space right now and sometimes even hitting into areas where I have shadow. One of the things you'll notice is as you get further into your drawing and adding shading to it, some of these little details like the dark lines on the apple, uh, some of the like little eyelets on the sweet potato and so forth start to become a little bit easier to see as you actually get more detail. Things that would have felt really overwhelming at the very beginning of your drawing start to just make more and more sense and start to feel like little touches rather than taking on this whole challenge. And then the very last thing is to go and really make sure our darks are as dark as we want them to be. So this is where I'm going to really go in kind of really let myself push down hard where I think I need those darkest darks. And really all I'm doing is I'm not really adding new information as much as I'm adjusting information. So I'm looking for like shapes and shadows that I've already put in my drawing and I'm just adjusting them so that they work that much better within this drawing. You know, and occasionally you may feel, find an area where you're like, you know, what, I kind of put that moment too late or too dark and, you know, do not be afraid to go in and adjust it. And kind of the last step is to kind of draw with our eraser. Something to keep in mind is we often, when we think of drawing, we think about it as an additive, like, activity, meaning we're taking pencil and we're adding graphite to our page. But you can also draw by removing material through your eraser. Um, so I can go and kind of remove some of that line work that I put in earlier. Um, my onion has a little bit of kind of a streakiness, so I can kind of, you know, add the texture of the onion wrap and skin. And I can find a moment where I maybe went a little too far with my shadow and cut back into it a little bit. Um, and something else I can do is I can kind of find moments where I have highlights where the outline, or sorry, where I have outlines that are darker than the edge of the object. So for example, right there, I had an outline on my sweet potato that was much darker than the shadow was around it. And what happens when the outline is darker than the value of the object around it is it actually flattens it out. So I'm going to do the same thing over here on this red onion. You know, like this is, this edge is in shadow, but it's not that strongly in shadow. So I'm gonna lighten it up a little bit. And then if I need to, I can always go back in and re-add that little bit of shadow. And you'll see that hard edge of the line's gonna disappear. And it's just gonna more feel like an object that's rounded and going back into space. Once again, I can just keep on playing around and making adjustments as I feel they are appropriate. Went a little dark there, so I'll just smudge it. Clean up that edge. And voila! We have now created a drawing that has a good range of shading on it and a variation of values that have worked to help create a sense of form, light, and placement of our objects.